about the guide which you should have on your table, so it might be useful to kind of pick one up to follow along. Um, I'm going to be looking at what it is and how you can use it. Um, so just to start with, just a little recap. Uh, so as both, both Ash and Susan said, we started by looking at family learning prison programs and we found that programs are really diverse and so are their outcomes. So we sort of started to speak to providers and look at what outcomes might come about as a result of family learning in prisons. We've got things like increased interest in learning and skills. So we know that among the prison population, there can be quite negative attitudes towards learning and skills and that, that that can be transformed. It can transform the experience for a child of visiting prison. We know from the Pharma report that, from the Lord Pharma report, that you know, in the long run, increased family ties can contribute towards reducing reoffending and that family learning is one way to do that need to, in some cases, for some courses, qualifications or accreditation for adult learners, which obviously might lead to employability outcomes. Parents more engaged in child schooling, literacy and numeracy, improved well-being for adults, improved relationship with children, and then building supportive peer relationships within groups and all the rest. So don't worry, you don't have to read those all. It was kind of just for dramatic effects um, to show that we're dealing with a lot of outcomes from different programs. So our task and our challenge was that we needed to create a set of tools that can be used to measure these outcomes consistently across family learning in prison programs because as, as Ash said there's been issues with just having small scale interventions and you know, needing to aggregate that data to show the impact of family learning in prisons. But at the same time, what we didn't want to do was just take a top-down approach and say everyone needs to measure these outcomes because outcomes are different and programmes are diverse and providers should have the flexibility to be able to measure the outcomes that they think their programmes produce. Um, and the other challenge we were facing is that staff, you know, as Ash mentioned, it's not often that they'll be an external evaluation commissioned or that there'll be someone that works in research within a provider team. So often it will be frontline staff who obviously know loads about the programme but maybe don't know loads about research and evaluation. Um, so we wanted the tools to be easy to use and as far as possible not, not too labour intensive. So that's why we created a guidance document showing how to use them, which is what I'll take you through. So one of the first things we did, which I think is on the theory of change as well, is that we came up with some categories of outcomes that we thought could be kind of consistent across most programmes. So those are things like family relationships. So most family learning programmes are going to impact family relationships in some kind of way. Um, learning and skills outcomes. So that might be accredited learning, or it might be something like parenting skills, but we thought that that was generally going to be an outcome from family learning. Um, impacts on well-being, um, that could be self-explanatory, wider relationships, so that could be with peers on the course, with staff members, um, or just generally more pro-social behaviour. We thought that was something that, that speaking to providers comes out of family learning in prisons. And then in the long term, we're not saying that, you know, one short intervention has to contribute towards reoffending directly, but in the long term this should all contribute towards reducing reoffending. Um, so we thought that most of our outcomes could be categorised into, into these kind of wide, wider domains. Um, right. So what we've done is we've created the tutor guidance document, which is what we've got in front of you, and within that we've got core tools um, which are in the annex and which I'll take you through that have been designed to um, measure outcomes in each of those kind of broad domains and there's some flexibility around that in terms of how you want to use them and whether you want to use them. And there's some options for measuring wider outcomes. We've got some advice in there on things like consent and data ethics, data storage, analysis, presentation, things that you wouldn't necessarily know if you don't work in research and we wanted to make it easy and simple to do that. And then um, the other part of the toolkit, which you don't have in paper copy, is a spreadsheet that we've created, um, which includes a dashboard so that if you enter in your questionnaire results, you'll get automatically generated some statistics to show how things have changed in your course. So um, I'll take you through that as well on a slide deck. 
But again, we did that just to make it as simple as possible and, you know, to take some of the burden off providers of having to do any kind of data analysis or anything like that. Um, so if we start with the core data collection tools, um, these are some of the kind of principles that, that Ash mentioned. So you've got at least one tool for each of those categories that I had up before. Um, and we've got a mixture of quantitative tools, so things that can be quantified into um, kind of statistics and numbers, and qualitative tools. And we've tried to do, where possible, data from multiple perspectives and to make it flexible and broad enough to apply to most family learning programmes, regardless of the specific activity or size. Um, we've put some flexibilities in there um, that I'll go through as, as the presentation goes on. But, you know, for example, if it's a family learning day and it's a, it's a visit that lasts one day, you're not necessarily want to, going to want to do a pre and post measure in the way that you might do if it was a six-week course or a three-week course. So there are some kind of flexibilities in there. Um, so the tools are, the core tools, um, we've designed a self-completion questionnaire for the offender learner, and that's something that can be used pre and post program and will give you an idea of distance travelled, a feedback form for tutors, a feedback form for other staff members, so, um, and then we've suggested using learner progression data and incident log data as measures, and we've also done some optional tools for family members, we found that for some interventions it wasn't, it wasn't appropriate to interact with family members in that way, but for some interventions that did have better relationship with children or with accompanying adults, they wanted a way to collect data from them. So we've done, we've done that too. So just to start off with the learner questionnaire, um, let me just switch. So it's, if you want to look in the annex of your document, I think it's on page 43, or there's guidance for using it on page 12 and 13. Um, so we've built this learner questionnaire largely on social metrics. So that's just a kind of researchy term, but it's kind of questions that have been through a process where um, there's been psychological testing and we can say that they measure what they purport to measure. Um, so we've built it largely out of social metrics. Um, and the reason we've done that is that it, it's, sort of, it's more robust, so it allows us to um, draw more, more robust conclusions, and it also allows for benchmarking against the general population, because these are things that are used more widely, so we can compare it with um, a non-prison population, or we can do interesting stuff there that's, that's interesting for us. Um, this in itself, just the learner questionnaire, covers many of the core outcomes, so it looks at learner well-being, family relationships, wider relationships, and attitudes to learning and skills. Um, it's pretty easy to analyse because we've got our spreadsheet, and when you type it in to our spreadsheet, um, it will automatically generate results for you, so that's quite an easy thing to use and will give you results that you can extrapolate for, for reporting or for um, commissioning, um, for commissioners and governors. Um, it's quantitative results that are easy to collate. So when we have your results um, from the learner questionnaire, we can easily aggregate that with other providers and build that evidence base that we've been talking about. Um, and we've also got some qualitative stuff in there that should be helpful. So I'll take you through it. The first section is something called the Short Work in Edinburgh Wellbeing. Probably most of you will have either filled one in or recognise it from somewhere because it's a pretty widely used tool to measure well-being. Um, it's undergone a lot of testing, including within a prison context, so we thought that was quite a simple and easy way to, to measure that outcome. Um, so that would be completed pre and post programme. The second bit is... What is the second bit? Oh, yeah. So this comes from something called the Kansas Parental Satisfaction Scale. And it's also undergone testing and testing in a prison context. It's only going to be relevant if um, the learner has a child. But it's a good kind of broad measure of relationship and satisfaction with relationship with your child. Um, next, we have got a section on support networks. Um, 
we found that, I think Ash mentioned this, but a lot of the pre-existing metrics for support, um, social support and support networks weren't appropriate because they talked about things like neighbours and frequency of contacts and things that can be obviously really impacted by being in prison. So we came up with our own that we um, based off them but kind of tweaked so that they're appropriate for a prison context. Um, and then we've got something that we self-designed around attitudes towards learning and skills, which is just a, a tick box and also includes, if they do have a child, their, their feeling of being able to support their child with their education. So that's something quite key in family learning. Um, so that's something we wanted to measure. And then at the end, um, this is the only bit that differs between the pre-questionnaire and the post-questionnaire. We've got some qualitative questions. So at the beginning, we're asking them what they want to gain from the course and any issues they might be struggling with. And towards the end, we're asking about whether they feel like they've achieved their goals and you know, areas for improvement for the program. Um, so that's the offender learner questionnaire. So when should I give the questionnaire to the learners? Um, so at the start of the course, before any learning begins, and after the course ends, and this will measure distance travelled. So the idea with that is that you're looking at change over time. So it's we know that family learning interventions happen within a kind of complex circumstances where there might be other interventions going on at the same time. So um, learners' starting points might be different, but by measuring before and after, we should be able to kind of isolate the impact of the family learning. And what we're looking at is the difference. So it doesn't matter if someone goes from very low well-being to slightly less low well-being. We're seeing an improvement there. So it's it's less about it's about the difference between the, the pre and post. Um, if the course is less than one week, however, we don't recommend doing it pre and post because we think it's just too smaller amount of time. So for something like a family learning day, you might want to do it after just to get a snapshot of your learners, but it's probably not worth using it pre and post. Um, how should the learner complete the questionnaire? So if possible, with minimal input from the tutor or the provider staff, but where someone has learning disabilities or ESOL needs, they might need that, that support in order to fill it in. We've also got digital um, versions of this um, so uh, that if, if that's easier for anyone, we have that. Um, and how should I explain the purpose of the questionnaire? I think this is really key, and this came up with a lot of the um, prisoners and providers that we spoke to. Um, it makes complete sense that, that learners that are within prison might be cautious about giving this information to you, particularly because it's personal information. And we had kind of difficulty here because we didn't want to make it intrusive. And if I think about previous iterations, they probably were too intrusive and we've refined it and we've scaled it back so that as far as possible it doesn't, it doesn't seem too intrusive because particularly at the beginning of the course, before any learning start, before you've built a relationship with that person, it's difficult to ask these kind of questions. But at the same time, the outcomes that we're looking at are inherently personal, so we needed to ask some of these things. Um, I think it's really important to explain the confidentiality, anonymity, and its limits um, to the learners, and also to let them know that participation is voluntary, so people can't be forced to participate in, in research or evaluation. So that is really important. But in order to give them a kind of informed opportunity to participate, um, it's important to let them know that the questionnaire is not an assessment of them, which I think can be a misunderstanding, that it's about assessing the course and looking to improve the course as a whole and looking at the value of family learning as a whole. It's not going to go down on their record, it's not going to go beyond the provider and it's not going to yeah, in any way form a judgement on their progress. Um, <coughs> other tools and measures that we've got, uh, these are pretty straightforward, but we've got a qualitative feedback form for the tutor. This is stuff that normally tutors will already be thinking about and probably writing down, but it's just a more systematic way to do it. Um, and it asks the tutor to reflect on the learner's progress. Um, the other thing that we've done is create a feedback form for an additional staff member. We initially had this as a prison staff member, but we came up across loads of difficulties in terms of capacity of prison officers and whether or not they actually had a relationship with the, with the offender. So what we decided to do is 
just keep it a very short form. It just has two questions on it, and it can be filled in by a prison officer, by a librarian, by another tutor, or someone else in the education department. Um, and it's just to get another perspective, again, that triangulation, so that we've got different perspectives on the learner and their progress. Um, these are two other measures. Um, so um, I'll start with the learner progression data. So in terms of the impact that family learning can have on learning and skills, we thought it'd be interesting to look at progression onto other learning courses after completion of the family learning course. Um, so for most providers, they have access to this on the PNOMA system, from what we can tell, but let me know if that's not true. Um, but we put in a measure of the percentage of learners that go, go on to another course. And again, that can be recorded on the spreadsheet, and it will let you know automatically what percentage of your learners have gone on to another course, if you record the individuals. Um, and then we've got the incident log data, um, which we have been using as a proxy measure for kind of improvement in behaviour. Um, we came up against quite a few issues here in terms of the inconsistency of how it's measured across different prisons um, and by different officers. So again, um, this should be done cautiously or in some cases not at all, but it's an option. It's an option there for something we've come up with and for something that's embedded in the spreadsheet. Um, and then we've got data for family members. And again, this, this isn't core, it's optional. Um, in some cases, it might not be appropriate to speak to children or to speak to other family members. But we've included it, and we've also included some guidance on data ethics when working with children within our um, guidance document. Um, and where possible, and when it is appropriate, this just provides an important perspective on the learner's progress, as well as insight into their family relationships. Um, so we've done two questionnaires because um, we know that the way that children aged four to seven and then seven and up are able to kind of comprehend and understand surveys is quite different. Um, and these um, are quite, we intentionally made them quite unintrusive and just focused on, focused on the visit, um, but it just gives a chance for children to um, share their perspective on how family learning is impacting them. Um, right, so if we move on to inputting the data into the spreadsheet. Um, so as I said, we wanted to make it easy to manage, so we pre-programmed a spreadsheet um, for you. So we've got the first tab, and that just gives space for you to enter information on your programme. Um, that's useful if you have multiple courses and so you need multiple spreadsheets. And if we do have a kind of aggregate database, it will be useful to have, you know, where's this data coming from? Um, it's also useful because I'll come on to this later, but we've included in our spreadsheet options for storing data for a later Ministry of Justice Data Lab submission if you want to make one, and you'll need this information for that. Um, then... The most important tab um, is the participant data tab. So it's an anonymous tab. We've got learner ID numbers, so this data will be anonymous, so it won't be, it won't be personal. Um, and there's space for entering in some basic kind of socio-demographic stuff. We've got drop-down menus for that so that it's easy to use. And this just gives you an idea of who's on your course. Um, and then we've got space for entering data from all the, all the sources that I just mentioned, so all the different feedback forms, the questionnaire. Um, I would say probably the most important things to enter are the quantitative ones, so the learner pre-course and post-course questionnaire, because that will come out in the results page, and the incident log data, and the learner progression data. Um, the qualitative stuff you can enter in there and it's a good way to store your data. You might just want to pull out a few quotes that you want to save for reporting. Um, it's not necessarily, you know, you don't have to enter in everything because we know that's like quite labour intensive. Um, and this is what will come out. So you'll get your quantitative statistics. So um, the first section of the questionnaire on well-being, you'll get an overall score for improvement in well-being. Um, 
same with parental satisfaction, social support networks. Um, this is just fake data, by the way, that I entered. So as you'll see, it comes up green if there's a positive difference, and it comes up red if there's a negative difference. So for this fake data, it's um, come up with a kind of decrease in positive attitudes towards learning and skills, but that's just, it's not real. So, um, and we also come out with uh, the percentage of people that go on to another course within one month and the average number of incidents both pre and post program. So um, we all know that family learning is much more complex than just a set of numbers and there's loads that can be done in terms of quotes um, and looking at the more qualitative data to try and kind of explain this and really bring to life the course, things like creating case studies. Um, but this gives a pretty simple way to pull out Kind of change over time in terms of in terms of these metrics. Um, we've also got a tab for the Ministry of Justice Data Lab. The reason we've done this is when we spoke to people about measuring reoffending using the data lab. Part of the issue was about storing the data over time. So you need to have a minimum of 60 learners in order to make a submission. Uh, those can be accrued over time if it's the same course and you have a cohort of. 10 every month. You can do it over six months, but you need to be able to store that data um, and make sure that you have everything they need. So as much as possible, data just transfers across from our participant data tab onto this tab. Um, so you don't need to enter it in twice, but this also gives you a space to enter in the things that you need when you've got those people on your program so that once you've got 60 learners, you can then make that submission. Um, does anyone not know what the Ministry of Justice Data Lab is? Okay. Um, so what... Uh, I'm trying to think how to say this in non research terms. But what the Ministry of, Justice Data, Ministry of Justice Data Lab does is looks at the one-year um, post-release reoffending rate and compares that to a matched group that haven't been on your programme. So it should be able to look at the impact of your programme on reoffending. Um, and some of the issues that providers have with it is that it, you need at least 60 learners. That's quite a large cohort. Most family learning programs are smaller than that. So we wanted to look at, okay, how can we help people to get up to those 60 learners so that they can make a submission? And one of the ways we thought to do that was just to integrate it into the spreadsheet that we've got so that you can kind of accrue that over time and then make a submission once you've got 60 learners. Um, so, yeah. Um, how to use the data, so again, the, qu the quantitative data is pretty simple. It will, it's something that you can just extrapolate from the spreadsheet. Um, so yeah, we just tried to um, cut that kind of workload from the providers by making that automatic. The qualitative data can be used to give more detailed insight into the program and into its impact. And you may want to use qualitative data to build case studies. That can be quite a good way of bringing the program to life and demonstrating that to commissioners um, and governors. Um, and we've also provided some advice on secure storage and data protection with your data. Um, so those are the kind of core things that we came up with. Um, you don't have to use them all, but those are the things that we thought might be most relevant across the board. But what we wanted to do was acknowledge the fact that programs are different, different from each other and can be quite varied. Um, so there might be outcomes for a literacy program that has to do with improved literacy skills that obviously you're not going to get from a parenting skills program or from an arts and crafts program necessarily. So um, what we did was add in some additional measures to capture outcomes um, and some other kind of suggested outcomes and that sits in the back of our resource. Um, I can't remember what page it is now. I think it's page 69, so it's Annex 11, um, and we've got a table there which just sets out, um, it's not meant to be comprehensive, but it's much more comprehensive than the, than the core tools, a kind of different range of outcomes um, that might be more specific to your programme, um, so we've got the outcome categories, and then we look at who changes, how do they change, and we've suggested some different tools and measures that you might want to use to capture that. Uh, so if we go um, through an example, so a provider works closely with offenders' children in the community as well as running a family learning programme within the prison. They want to gain more extensive evidence of the impact of the programme on child's attitudes towards learning. 
So they use the child questionnaire that we've given them, but they don't think that's enough because for their program, they think there's more of an impact there that they want to capture. Um, so they could use the table, find that, and we've suggested um, doing a family interview, and we've also suggested feedback from the child's school, which we know there are loads of problems with, but in some cases, that, that might be feasible and appropriate. Um, so that's one example. I've got another example. Um, a provider runs a parenting programme which includes family learning visits. They're writing an annual report in the programme for a governor commissioner. They use the core tools but feel they don't showcase the impact of the programme in full. Um, and during visits, tutors have noticed a dramatic change in the way offenders interact with their children. Um, so they use the table um, and they, they want to measure, they want to demonstrate the kind of change in the way that offenders and their children interact, they notice more purposeful play and different kind of learning embedded into their interaction. Um, and so we've suggested different tools that you could use to measure that. Um, so yeah, what I wanted to do, um, we can do questions first, but is a practice round where I'll hand out different kind of types of interventions and we look at how we could use the, the tools to measure them. Yeah. I've got a couple of questions. Use the table. I couldn't really get how you use the table. So, okay. Uh, you, you go to the section. Did you go back one side? Don't mind. You go to evidence of change. Is that where you look? So what so, I would probably do is say you've got an outcome and it's that you're noticing there's a change in the activities that that families do together. I would look within the outcome domain. So it's a family. It's, it's obviously a family relationships outcome, so you'd probably look there and see if it's something we've got and if we've suggested measures for it, and if we have, we will have suggested kind of when to use them. Okay, uh, and then when you go through this, so for example, the additional staff feedback mm. is, you know, narrative. Are you saying that's only qualitative? You've not made it quantitative at all, as in you haven't made it like, if it's positive or negative, so how many positive comments have been made, mm. or how many negative comments? No, we haven't. Um, is that something that you... No, I just thought that it's an easy way to see whether you tick the box to see if it's a positive comment. So I'm biased because I'm mainly a qualitative researcher. <laughs> <laughs> um, quantitative results are great and they're great for aggregation in particular. So it would be very difficult to aggregate qualitative feedback from all family learning prisons into one database to say this is what family learning does because it's just more nuanced and more complex than that. Um, but um, what qualitative stuff can do is really kind of contextualise and bring to life an intervention and, um, yeah, just demonstrate the kind of complexity of it. So it might be that a learner's, you know, on an individual level, like a learner's well-being has decreased. Well, when we put that into the aggregate, aggregate kind of quantitative evidence base, it will kind of come out in the wash, like you know those individual drop-offs. But the the kind of qualitative feedback can really kind of highlight the complexity of like why that might be. You know, there might have been some external thing that that intervened there, and so we've done the learner questionnaire as quantitative because it's probably. You know, data from the learner themselves is probably the thing you most want to most want to focus on, and that's yes, Susan. I was just going to intervene. <laughs> I'm sorry, and say um, one of the reasons that we don't report it um, in terms of the staff and the staff observations, etc., is because we have got something that is not subjective, which is the instant raw data. So, if you're saying that at the beginning or at the beginning and end of a, a period the number of incidents that were recorded over that time is, has lessened, and that's actually quite a powerful, um, powerful quantitative measure. So we didn't want to miss that. Hmm. We didn't think we needed an extra quantitative measure for the staff um, perceptions, because that's actually much more difficult and much more subjective. But I think what we're looking at here in this toolkit is um, what um, Ash was talking about, is about triangulation. It's about looking at what information, what data can we get to strengthen um, our case for this has made a difference. And it comes from many different directions and many different forums. So I think what um, Ricky's saying now, that the quality is useful, 
It is useful, and it's useful in a different way, but not subject to the same quantitative analysis. Sorry. I'm going to pile in here as well. Um, the other thing is the, the, the scale of it. So over a couple of years, you might have 60, 70 levels. You can do quantitative stuff with it. Over a couple of years, you might have three, maybe four tutors living the course. Even if you can quantify that, you, know, it, you, you can't draw anything from it. Um, so the, the, for, for, for that particular group, quality method measures are much better. We've got the learning records, we've got the, the, the quant set from the learners themselves. Um, Question, thank you. Anyways? We've also got the issue of churn as a previous I'm certainly um, for our work is a massive, massive issue. Um, and for me there's the or I think there's a lot of it, I think it's great. For me, there's still something before you get to the point of having a group given all those questionnaires. There's the kind of how you get there, what goes before the recruitment into these programs. I was wondering if that sort of so the way that I see this questionnaire working would be to wrap around the kind of family learning element. So I was wondering whether that kind of fit with what you were saying earlier around needing interventions before you get to that point. And whether for you it might be something that wouldn't come at the beginning of the intervention, but might wrap around, for example, a parenting course that comes later on. Yeah, and I think it's understanding where individual prisoners are coming from. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, I've got children themselves, you know, with a lot of child protection, a lot of um, you know, children in, in care proceedings, a lot of things like restraining orders and things, which is also quite complicated. And I think it's about kind of understanding where individuals are, are at in coming and what their expectations are coming to the programme as well. Um, so I think it's about knowing your, your, knowing your cohort almost mm. to, before you get to the point of, of actually you know, getting them into a room and getting them into a course. But I'd say against that you've also got quite a churn. So you know, we've got a lot of prisoners on demand who um, they might engage very well with us but very, very briefly and they're gone. Mm. And that's, that's quite an issue. Yeah, you know, at the children at the same point, I remember, because it was after we met you and your colleagues, yeah. we talked about what should be included in the, the tutor feedback, mm -hmm. and we created that space for, for people to say, you know, the person left the course because they knew the prison didn't, you know, yeah. all those external factors. And then again, again, it's kind of thinking about, we wanted to make sure that we account for that move because that's beyond the control of the individual learner yeah. and it's beyond the control of yourself. It's an yeah. external factor that you need to address. Yeah. So we do want to capture it. And yeah. again, hopefully that the tutor feedback would be the way that you'd be able to at least start getting an idea of what the reasons why someone yeah. disengaged from the course is. Yeah. And then, you know, or actually do it at the start because I think sometimes you know, yeah. we see people, it's not the right thing at this point in time to actually mm. be in a room on a family themed course. I mean, I had a classic one you know, this week of you know, a chap who um, you know, wants to evidence that he's doing the right thing while he's in prison, but actually, you know, what's beyond picture, the reality is care proceedings finally here and his children are going to be adopted, and actually it is not the right thing, and yet he absolutely, no, I must do this. And we have to say, no, that's, you know, this is not right for you. You needed, you know, support to actually come to us what happened. So it, it's being able to kind of, um, I guess, capture that and, and also being able to um, ensure, to say, that it, it's, it's the right thing. I don't yeah. know that it is always the right thing. I think, I think that's... What you're saying, I know, is, is not right for everybody. It's mm -hmm. just like this programme is not right for somebody's on vocational training course. Do you know, because that's pretty way. So this is specifically for people that are doing family learning, but they're not doing family learning if they, they're not ready for family learning yet, because yeah. they're doing, they've got their own intervention. So the process is around this, and how, how yeah. what so, what, so it's part of the business sequence, uh, sequencing and planning of their curriculum. So it's how they put people onto courses and give people the opportunity to engage in provision like this. Mm -hmm. it's, it's up to you know, throw that back to the business to make sure that they're doing that through their census planning. Uh, so, you know, it's, I think the people around us that have designed this is they're saying is if somebody's on a family learning program, mm. this is what you do. It's not saying you should do this for everybody. 
And we wouldn't envisage you giving it to them at the first point of contact. It would be if it is the right thing for them to do and if they are going to take part in a family learning course. To be honest, I was just going to see what Mark said before, but not as well, actually. I mean, if we were trying to meet that tool, something for everyone, um, then we'd be looking at um, how many people would like to do it, how many people actually go on to it, you know, all yes. that kind of stuff. Now, as Mark says, that's, there is a whole process for accepting inside, inside the prison, as you know, we're accepting people onto a family learning course in prison, and that's got lots, you know, lots of different considerations, uh, much of which the tutors won't know about it, so what kind of restraining orders are there, well, that's, you know, what kind of offence was it? Is there tension, history of violence, etc., etc.? And then there's the attitudes of readiness as well, and the priority in the um, learning plan for that prisoner in that prison and for that sentence. So I think that these are they're not separate issues, obviously, but um, this is purely a tool for people who are doing it from the and on the question of churn, um, as I said there, um, what we don't want to do is to say, well, there were 75 people who um, enrolled in family learning courses across these three prisons. And actually, uh, we had a, an 80% dropout, because actually the dropout, that 80% dropout might have been because 80% of them were moved to other prisons where they didn't have a similar course. Or it was interrupted. Now, what we are trying to do, however, with this is to see if you have a group of prisons, let's say the group of prisons in the North East, which is one of the various, um, and there's about, I think there's 12 prisons in the North East, there's a lot of them anyway, because we've been around them all. And there, if you were running the same value, the same um, shape of family learning, it's all one provider anyway, and you had a similar, evalu the same evaluation tool. There is the opportunity to transfer between one and the other, very unlikely because of the, um, the timings, but there is a comparison that could be made across them, and that's one of the, the primary things that we're trying to measure here. So yes, I agree with you, it's not for everybody family learning, uh, certainly not at particular stages, and there is lots of work to be done around this side, there's lots and lots of issues. Can I ask another question about the dashboard? Mm -hmm. uh, so if somebody only does the post, Course, yeah. Would it still have meaning in the dashboard? No. <laughs> in short, um, so if someone only does the post course questionnaire, you're not going to get that change over time measured. So, um, so in the short course is how we capture that in the dashboard for these one day like family learning. It will compile the data, so you won't really want to get is the distance travel the difference between the two measures but it will give you the profile. So you will get the average, so for example, if you had a cohort of 10 learners, you'd get the average wellbeing score, but what you wouldn't get is the difference between pre and post. Have you got a copy of what the dashboard looks like? It's in the guidance um, document under the spreadsheet. I think it's a kind of blue tab. No, it's page 32. Oh, yeah. Um, and we can also send you the spreadsheet itself. I was just imagining some sort of pie chart or something. You know, like no. <laughs> it wouldn't really work, does it? If it's a, stra if it's a standard spreadsheet, which is what yeah, you're going to, yeah. then of course you can regenerate what you're going to do, whatever you want to do. Yeah. 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 Can I ask a question? Maybe a daft one, because I'm. Uh, but I mean, in terms of, we talked before about you know being generous about a definition of family learning, mm. you know, not getting so hung up about it. But for two, the sort of before and after, is the definition of family learning here got to be at least sort of, say seven days somewhere? Did I read somewhere about? Do you see what I mean? So that's not the definition. It's just in terms of whether it's worth doing a pre and post pre measure. That's what I'm so yeah, in terms of. Because we, you know, governors are required to do uh, visitor surveys at least twice a year. We're sure. trying to beef that up and give a, a refined survey that allows them to do pie charts and, you know, about satisfaction, using the smile face, satisfaction yeah. stuff for a lot of the qualitative stuff. 
Um, so I, I guess that's that bit about, um, what am I saying, I suppose, our family service providers, the one of their common refrains is, they've got lots of stuff to tell you, but you never ask us for the information. You know, mm -hmm. in terms of evaluation of just a eight days visit or a family day or something like that, you never ask us for it. You know, we've got lots of stuff to tell you. But it seems to me this is quite applicable for that one-off thing, you know, part, part in itself, but also, you know, that continuity. Mm. I suppose for me, in terms of education providers, and I'm not, um, we're not into this business of mandating, but I guess again it's that bit, if you're getting together with family providers, education providers, key people in the establishment, about if you're asking for something under the family learning umbrella, you've got to have this conversation as well, isn't it, how you're going to evaluate. And I guess, so I'm guessing, but I hope I'm making sense, but a lot of the family service providers, are, we would say we've got an evaluation to all of they would automatically evaluate. But, so I'm just openly just sort of saying, I guess you would leave it to that discussion, would you? Because that's the common frame. I think every family service provider would be able to evaluate what they're doing if they're going to give you a report or something. Yeah. Does, does that kind of make sense? Well, you know, it's, it means part of the conversations to. When you know, mentioned what people, people were, do, were producing for yeah. the reports and short courses, not, not just talking about one year, talking about many days, not actually even for any family learning course, the vast majority of them were of the ilk of, was it something that you liked, was it something that was useful, um, did you like it? It wasn't really looking at outcomes, whether short, in any sense, not intermediate, not long, but set, not even short. So what I would say, please correct me, and in fact that you should probably learn this as better than me, in terms of one day intervention, you're not expecting that a one day intervention, bring together, etc., is going to make any substantial long-term impact. However, personally, I think it could have a short-term impact. So, let's say you had a good time to come around the, um, the parent, the prisoner, is, oh, actually, that was really good. Maybe I should do more about that. Is that then the stimulus for um, signing up to or a plan to be uh, to be taking a family learning course, which would give a more sustained impact? Um, so there certainly could be some. If you were looking at, um, should a provider use so, um, use this, not before and after, not necessarily yeah. because you're going to get a very small percentage, you're really going to go and, um, and go get on to a family mm -hmm. learning course. But as um, Rick was saying, you can get a sort of snapshot of this is encouraging yes. um, because it's got, it's got tools there to see that the children can use, as it tools there that the adults can use. And if you wanted a snapshot of evaluation, you could use some of them, but you just wouldn't get the before and after statistics. Can I ask a little bit? There's quite a few of um, the contracts and the work that is kind of going on. Is there an expectation that perhaps that we begin to use this rather than some of those um, evaluation tools that you, that you were describing that are out there? Is, is, should we be now kind of moving towards what everybody working towards this with any kind of family learning intervention? I mean, there's a really good question because that's that balance of um, we're in this bit about sort of in, I suppose, trying to put foundation, you know, sort of the structures in place where these things can happen. happen. And, um, I suppose it's um, um, you know, introducing tools. It's, it's that bit about, and you must use this. Because, you know, for example, the Vista Server, we're going to put out a, when we do the families measure, we're going to probably put out a tool which is built on what we think is the best the best visitors survey, you know, for example. We probably won't say you must use that, because the must is you must have uh, a visitors, you must do a visitors survey, I'm going to say at least two, two, two times a year, and you, you have to demonstrate how that feeds into your development of this and that's our common frame of this. And so, so I suppose that I'm just, the must is that you must survey, and here, the must, if there's a must, it's you must evaluate. Do, do you see what I mean? Uh, so it's just interesting, and whether we spec, and then, and here's a good, here's one we prepared earlier on, right? you don't want to, that's the sort of, and I think it's probably one of my things I'll say is how do you get this out, you know, because it's about different tools, isn't it, that mm -hmm. establishments, so here's a, here's a good tool that can be very flexible for this one, you know, family day, or can provide some continuity. I suppose I'll ask, sorry, I'll ask a question back to you then, in terms of the new contracts, how much are we saying to, to you know, 
traditional learning or some of those other learning outcomes, how much is it being said about how the provider must provide evidence of X and Y? Is it, or is it just simply based on qualifications? Is that the only sort of outcome for learning generally? Do you see what I mean? You know, is it, is it going to be this be a I think a lot of this stuff would be really useful, not just from a prison point of view in terms of what we're evidencing as family work, but it, it, it may also be useful evidence to generate for, for, for off-study inspections, for sort of self-analysis self, self and our, our, our sort of um, SAR, you know, self-assessment reports and stuff. So this is something that I'm very keen on using. However, I could probably, uh, maybe I'll see you at, at, at how do I actually access it? Yeah, yeah. How do I how do I get my learners on to um, answer these questions so I can form part of that as part of that? Um, can I just say something about accessing it? We have already sent it to the Nico site. Yeah, no, yeah. um, the films that were taken today, plus the presentations, plus this itself as a um, publication. Um, plus the <coughs> sending the spreadsheet in spreadsheet format. And there's something else. Um, oh yes, the last year's publication as well, which led up to just for interest, are all going in multiple places that you can get, and you will get a list of these. Nico itself, on uh, the virtual campus, uh, under the families tab, which um, Lewis can tell us where that is again, because I've forgotten. Uh, but we got one set up last year, with Megan X specifically for family learning, for family learning in prisons. Uh, it's going in Learning Works website as well. We will send it out through the mailing list. Um, and we'll, I'm sorry, the mailing list is not our mailing list, it's HMPPS's mailing list. Um, because we're very keen that it doesn't just go to tutors, but it also goes to commissioners or people who are responsible. About it. So, heads of learning skills, reducing reoffending, governors, etc. We haven't done a huge print run of this. So the people who are here are practically probably the only people who are going to get it in hard copy. Um, but we will send it to all of that lot. What we are seeing today, however, is a special offer. I'm very good at this. Is if you're here and you want more than one, that's fine because I don't want to carry them back. But they're not. We're not going to do what we did with the last publication, which is sending around to every prison in England to three or four people. A, it's very expensive, and B, we find that we're not absolutely sure that it got to the right people. Anyway, so there's multiple channels. Does that make sense? And the films do have a purpose, so to put the context. So if you were doing, for example, a, um, a, what you call it, a development day with staff, you could use snippets of um, the films, you could use stuff itself, um, and we're going to have some interviews afterwards. Mark? Thank you. Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. I think the idea of the app, and the gentleman just mentioned from what we that uh, is really useful. It's a really useful tool for something for us to capture for the plan of learning. Because there isn't a qualification based uh, output uh, for in a lot of the interventions we're doing, so like Homework Clubs, for example. Uh, the, currently, we try and find an output, and we try and find our own. So, for example, one of the techniques we set people targets at the beginning of the course and then at the end of the course we measure whether they've achieved those targets you know and then we can then see whether there's been an outcome based on the provision that we've provided uh, so we, we always want to like we said we want to always capture an evidence for Ofsted or our own contracts and you know for planning and curriculum to see whether things are worthwhile so this is going to be really really useful my question back to you is I can see you piloted it to create it, but have you piloted it now that it's been created? And have you got some outcome, you know, like to say that it is actually uh, being utilised in the way that we hope it's going to be utilised yet or not? Well, the answer to that one, Mark, sorry, I'm just going to show you. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yes, no, you're right, you, did, and you haven't piloted it. Now it's been created. It was piloted at every stage, yeah. so every bit of it has been tested. But that's not the same as doing a sort of concept. What we would like to do is to go back to the PPS and say, we have created this. What we would like to do is to um, pilot it, get some data and see how it works, and support presence where required.
required to be able to complete um, or to be able to uh, customize the use of this tool for their own um, context, if you like. Whether or not HMPPS finds that, of course, or not, is out of my control, I'm afraid. I'm just going to go all over it. <laughs> I think also what what would be really interesting from our perspective is when we get that aggregate database to start to look and do some data analysis in terms of the impact of family learning in prisons, looking at different demographics, looking at different courses and how they work, that would contribute towards the kind of gap that we first identified at the outset of this project, which is that there isn't that aggregate data. Can I so thought we've been involved in helping you uh, come up with the ideas and create the ideas and by answering questions at different points. <laughs> but I'm you know, willing still to continue to try it out before you want to. Uh, you just need to push me a bit more. Um, can I say back to Kerry's point um, about the level of some mandation compared to um, doing it on the way? Um, my, my only observation on that is that I would very much use it towards more sort of um, use providers or prisons themselves adopting this voluntarily by seeing the value of it. But it comes back, you know, you can force people to collect data through commissioning practice uh, and it's done regularly. The problem with that is, is it then gets thrown into that tick box exercise. You don't get a visual on what the outcome is. And then that, you know, if that's the case, the people collecting the data, in this case the cheaters are going to be really key to this, um, they're not going to see the value, they're not going to invest in it. They're just not going to get you know, spend a lot of time doing it. Um, if you can get their support, if they feel part of that process, it will improve the data and that improves the, the, your evidence. Well, if you force people to do it, it, it just gets rushed and the data you get is junk. Um, <coughs> yeah. I would completely agree with Flash on that one actually. I think what I'd be keen on, of course, I'm not HMPPS or even MOG. But what I'd be keen on is um, that people recognise that a shift towards outcome-based measurement is key to keeping going, to making your case, to um, satisfying Ofsted, to satisfying um, governors, quality improvement groups and so on. That what we did as a sector in the past is not necessarily the best way forward, which tended towards the... Um, the less rigorous end of evaluation. Now, by that, we don't mean that everyone's got to be quantitative, etc. What we're saying is this is a toolkit to help prisons to do what, to produce outcome-based results. Um, it's by no manner of means the only approach, and in this one, you'll notice there's lots of flexibility. So if I was doing, for example, a really, really specific course on um, family art, for example, what could be further from um, something which is vocationally based. Family art or family cooking. Could I use this? Yes, I could. What outcomes would I be looking for? I'd be expecting that the family relationships would help, uh, would be built up. I would be expecting that the well-being of the various stakeholders would improve. And I might just stick at that. I'd say, that's not bad. I've had to show those two things. That's absolutely great. We're not expecting that every course, at every point, for every stakeholder to show multi all these multiple benefits because there's far too many of them. And I think that's... Um, so if we shift towards an outcome-based approach and these tools are part of the armoury that you have to be able to measure these outcome-based approaches, I think we'll have, been achieve we'll have achieved what we set out to do. Do you want to do your, you can do your next class? Have you got yeah. Oh, so we yeah. have. <laughs> In that case then, let me just turn back to Mark again and um, ask if he can just summarise his Richard. time. Richard. Richard. <laughs> Sorry. That would be Mark. That's Richard. Richard. It was such a good bad day. Yeah. Just, yeah, a, yeah, yeah, just a quick up. summary. If you wouldn't mind, <coughs> towards the front end of the day. Um, yeah, so... Uh, I think I no, picked up a couple of things. I mean, in terms of uh, the role, I sort of started off by talking about um, the importance of structure to get things into place to sort of provide enabling environments. 
So I think I, the things I'm taking out of this is given that so I'm family's leader, we've talked about um, education in those two terms. There's definitely something for me we've got to take forward about giving more, creating a clearer conversation about what is family living. I mean, we, we've said that it's a, it's a generous definition, but I definitely think we've got to. I've got to get out there and part of my role in terms of linking with this, this side of the family sort of work is about is, is engaging on what is family learning. Because I think there's some key people there, governors, you, you said governors, but I think we've got to have that discussion about that, bring that discussion to, to them and key people in the establishment to ask themselves the question what is family learning, get that sort of cross-functional discussion about what we're doing in that space. And I then I think there is something there for me about if we're going to encourage that conversation, then therefore encourage uh, activity across the family education sort of functions, then we do have to start thinking ourselves about how is that evaluated and that issue about um, are we just enabling, are we just saying say you must evaluate, I think that's a principle, and this becomes a useful tool to to take that uh, to that uh, to, to the that forward. So the practical things I've, I've got to do is, is have a discussion with Richard which is the original person here. So to, we need another engagement about this area so we, we cross that divide between families and education so we do something uh, together. I think personally we have, I, I talked about we have a families conference, we have our second families conference in the, in the spring and definitely we need to have something on family learning as a very a clear part of that to sort of make that loop uh, uh, together. Um, so, yeah, I think it's about raising the profile, cutting across boundaries. It's just the theme of my work is when, it, when things cut across boundaries, sometimes they get a bit lost. So we, we've got a responsibility with our education partners to make sure that happens. I'll, have, I'll start having some conversations, encourage the debate locally, enable them, and then this becomes a tool. Because I think most of them say that as a principle, if we're going to do something, we have to evaluate it in some shape or form. I mean, it's not just good enough just to leave it alone. So they're the, um, they're the themes that um, uh, I've got. And I'm, I'm just reminded that Lord Farmer, you know, had Lord Farmer as one of his, so had family learning as one of his uh, offers. So that provides a drive, uh, drive for, for governors to, to get focused on that. That's my comments. Okay.